Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to Between the Lines, a call and response show hosted by myself and usually Kem Lin Tan, who is in a very odd role reversal on a plane right now and cannot join us, but she sends her warm regards from the air. And I am incredibly excited to have Eric Vallis, the founder of Poetry Festival Singapore with us. Uh, he will have several guests joining, including several of his students uh, who will be reading as well. So we're in for a real treat. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the stage to Eric Vallis. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lucian, um, and all uh, for being here tonight. Uh, we are going to talk about starting over uh, as embodied by that mythical beast that is um, the phoenix, which is also central to um, the culture of um, um, the Southeast Asian Chinese. Uh, or the Paranakans here uh, in Singapore and Malaysia. Um, and um, I'm going to read three poems tonight. Um, the first one is personal. It's about my moving here um, from Taipei on New Year's Day, uh, the year 2000, um, at the turn of the millennium. Um, and one of the things that I will miss, that I, I miss about Taipei, is this delicacy called stinky tofu. Uh, which is um, bean curd and vinegar and sour vinegar. And you can smell it uh, from miles away. Um, but that, I never get to smell that here uh, in Singapore. Um, and this is it, um, stinky tofu. I'll miss stinky tofu wafting through, wafting around sundown from non-grilled windows on narrow lanes like friends made after hours of language exchange. Its sour vinegar is like endless tingsie every morning in class, a bloodletting to master Mandarin. Friends of friends crowing, are you from Hong Kong? Brine is flavored with chili and minced meat, like plane tickets and freebies, even a water cooler once offered to reporters as part of the job, like a color photo next to my column. Tofu is golden like sunlit clouds shrouding the Taipei Basin in summer. Freewheeling democracy, briefings I half understand, friends half translate. Eating tofu makes strange music like a slight drizzle and breeze or an emphatic pause after an IT executive tells me to read out my interview notes. The sweet stench is gone like a daydream. Yesterday's front page byline beside Bill Gates's photo or a chat with a cabbie with beetle stained teeth. You look Japanese. Stinky tofu, whoever is lucky to gobble you up cannot make me savor you less as I recall your glories now as a nameless graduate student in a detail scented Singapore library. That's the end of the poem. And uh, it's about, as I said, my move here um, in 2000, I was a business reporter in Taipei uh, for um, Taiwan News, one of three English dailies um, uh, in Taiwan. And I, I joined the um, the graduate program of literature in a university here uh, in 2000. Yeah, that, that, that's it. That's uh, my personal experience of starting over. Um, the second poem is uh, more serious. It's about um, the Boxing Day um, disaster uh, in um, Sri Lanka and other places here. Um, okay, and um, for several years I was exploring um, trauma, uh, different types of trauma in, in poetry, how to depict something unspeakable as psychological wounds uh, using tropes um, and um, some sound effects um, in, in verses. Um, so this is Hachubiborn. 
sunlight pierces through the cigarette ash cloud at fisher folk trembling, an outrigger waddling where fish abound. An eclipse once swallowed their world, claimed both boat owners and humble apprentices uprooted like water hyacinth or day old stubble. Dawn at this blue desert past the season of fruit after the Dies Irae is chanted, is unsought, not understood. Ruth lost a child weaving summer days, a full blossomed hibiscus garden to hungry shadows beneath rays. Mere nightmare, a stump, once her foot is all too real. Like a reproach, the sea quietly lets cracked depths heal. Where Anung naps, Ruth hopes is safe. On judgment day, waves will uncover the dead like thatched mats rolling across the bay. Yesterday was Christmas as the day before their flood. Ruth dreamt of the maiden who risked life to bear a child destined to shed blood. Sweet gushing of fetal blood tip taps in sync with Ruth's heart and lets her partake of creation. She'll fill Anu's crib as fisher kin their nets. It's the end of the second poem. Thank you. Give it up for Eric Pallas. Thank you very much, Lucian and all. So I'm looking forward to tonight and um, we've got plenty of voices from everywhere. So as Eric introduced our theme is Phoenix starting over and that second poem you read, Eric, hit me hard. I, I had just about forgotten about the Boxing Day tsunami, but as the theme would have it, I had just shortly transitioned away from being a yachtsman, delivering boats between Singapore and Phuket, Ao Chao Long Bay. And had I not done that a couple of years prior, I would certainly be sleeping soundly after a night of merriment in Ao Chao Long Bay when that event took place. And so that particular event is very haunting to me and I appreciate the tribute that you offer to it. Very well, who would like to offer their poems next? Rick Spizak. Thank you, my friend. I have a little offering uh, to the concept of Phoenix. I was thinking of love as a Phoenix. This Phoenix is love burnt up in desires fires so little required burnt up to ash in love's immolation inspired required recapitulation each day renewed reborn in love's awful pledge self-destruction is just part of love's wedge rebirth renewal at each dawn of day its fires rekindle in the heat of love's play Inspiring the fires of desire, immolation of the self, all simply love's kindling, the abolition of self, love's hidden wealth, rebirth, renewal, all like the phoenix reborn, the wealth granted in fire, all that love's self-denying gift require. All the love, all the ashes, just some of love's lifting gift, Immortal beloved Beethoven's line, a mere shadow beside its true to everlasting, thou art eternally mine. Love's Phoenix. Wonderful. Thank that you. was lovely, uh, Rick. And, uh, you know, what inspired you to write that? Uh, well, Phoenix I I'm I'm a student very much of philosophy and religion, and I always look to the ancients uh, for for suggestions as how to interpret a symbol or 
or some concept. And uh, when I thought of that rebirth, uh, I thought of the, the morning's renewal and how those we love, those we care for, even though we may have you know, gone elsewhere in our dreams, we come back to the loves that we know and that love is refreshed and, and renewed. Uh, I thought of that as a, the rebirth I wanted to treat on. But thank you, sir. Yeah, it's, it's very good and it's quite deep and it, it links with uh, some uh, Asian ideas like the uh, Satyagraha, um, you know, um, self-abasing um, love uh, that uh, enriches other people. Great. Thank you, Rick. Ian Mack, would you like to take the stage, please? Yes, thank you. Um, well, it's good to see you in, in running the show, this year. Good to see you, your, your face again. Okay. Um, well, I started, I wrote two sonnets, so I put those up on the, um, the page. I think some of you may have read that. Uh, but then I wrote a longer one, and I was thinking a bit more like long term. Uh, can I share screen? Well, Is certainly. Possible? Um, so I think let's have a look. Ah, oh, here we go. Yeah. So this is the longer poem. It's called Rise and Fall. So it's maybe a bit gloomy, but thinking about the whole idea of regeneration and the idea of the phoenix rising up from the ashes and past civilizations. So rise and fall. Vague shapes, formless and swirling, emerge from the dust clouds of history's conflicted court of Assize. These unformed abstracts paint warped portraits from the debris of contested experience, cast in disarray, rising up like vile contagions from the vaults of collective memory. The tangled overlapping narratives where the winners, not the losers, sign off the accepted provenance, rubber stamped by blind prejudice. The rub of civilization, our own confected origins slanted barbarously in favor of those primeval forces that reduced Troy to cinders and fatal myth that saw Rome rise victorious from the fever-strewn Tiber marshes, crowned by the diadem of those seven hills, erasing those Etruscan upstarts from the palimpsest of recorded heroic deeds, only for them to be dug up in the confessional dirt on the flats of some shovel-bum's calloused spade, subject to the revisionism of archaeology, while Caesar's legions march triumphant along well-engineered highways that still map out the ley lines and threads of connecting networks that underlay our bustling roads and motorways today. But now those ghostly voices are coiled in wreaths of sombre smoke of burnt decaying leaves, a calling plaintiff as a gaunt phoenix rises from the enveloping flames of suppressed memories, whirling in a dance of death and stalled regeneration, as our precious earth burns, helpless with puny arms, performing sacramental gestures of remonstration against the blank background of suffocating future redemptions, torched and set ablaze while we stand here, staring in futile impotence, left to ponder if this jeweled phoenix will rise up again. Thanks, thank you. And let's see if I can- Beautiful uh, meditation on the cyclical nature of history, right? So we get to see uh, the phoenix rising from the ruins uh, in uh, various manifestations. Um, so Ian, uh, are you a historian? No, but I, I do like. Sorry, I, I do enjoy um, historical documentaries, um, and I've grown up, you know, like sort of reading and uh, sort of things about you know, like Roman history. And I also come from the literary literature perspective, 
you know, you're thinking about the origins, like, you know, the Virgil and um, uh, and uh, sort of the, the past um, literary figures. Um, That's wonderful. Oh, yeah. um, so, um, so you get to weave these um, historical allusions into your work, into your sonnets. Do you regularly write in the sonnet form? I don't actually know. It was the, okay. it was kind of, um, it was kind of inspired by your prompt in a way. Yeah. I normally write such things like sonnets and the short things and uh, uh, generally kind of random sort of images, you know, uh, impressions of life looking out of the window at Cafe Nero's in Reading over a coffee. But it was, yeah, it really kind of made me um, have to uh, think, but it was like writing first a couple of sonnets and then thinking, oh, I, I need to, I thought it was, there's something deeper in there, you know, about the whole uh, theme about things regenerating and also the idea about, will it carry on regenerating? You know, we're at, it's like a crossroads in, in a sense in our history, you know, whether we're thinking it, it's, it, you know, what will happen now next with climate change and um, uh, uh, those kind of developments. So thanks anyway. Yeah, Eric. thanks for being And do you think that we're in the process of uh, having a regeneration? <laughs> I hope so. Because <laughs> 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 if not, you know, the, the only... Uh, kind of alternative to that is no regeneration, you know, you know, <laughs> flatline. This con conflagration. Yeah, yeah, hopefully not, yeah. I think we maybe have, we may, we may be lucky we'll sort of escape by the skin of our teeth. Yeah. Thanks. It's great that we're moving from philosophy to history tonight. Yeah, it's great. I agree with Soy Avocado, Jennifer Leong. Rich imagery, Ian. I really enjoyed the word textures and ornaments that you applied throughout that piece. It was delicious. Thank you. Ravi, you have the stage. Thank you. Um, can I share screen? This uh, poem I started a couple of weeks before uh, the prompt uh, was highlighted. Uh, so it began as a poem which had um, uh, really nothing to do with the prompt, but then uh, as it grew and the prompt came up, somewhere it seemed to center itself around the metaphor of this, uh, the phoenix, though the phoenix doesn't figure in the poem at all, um, whatever the poem talks about perhaps is also uh, in a way uh, the a monologue that a phoenix may uh, indulge in at some point of time in its existence. So here goes, still center. So much stillness about us, ignored like a car parked, or a branch fallen and rotting, or a shrine after the morning buzzard. After all resonance of youth, the heart grows dull and expires like a joystick, spiraling smoke upon a breeze in a motionless universe, the reclusive will like a sunbird, foraying against its reflection that is the window pane, a raging old daughter unbuttons itself. There have been hours when near death has made of all the grabbing self a lover, willing away all to stand in quiet happiness. Trust with the soul, it then finds its perch like a bird homing upon a branch in the evening. Then a quietness ensues in which is a sounding deep and resonant as though one were traveling beyond all gravity, neither prograde nor retrograde, such irreference as only the untrammeled spirit can find. In its divine slovenliness, 
the sprawling cosmos confronts the mind with its immensity. All action then is a melding and a vanishing. Flung utterly, all embodiments fragment, reform. There's a civility in such fracture, which leads to new architecture, to an astral novelty never known before. Is there a will beyond the human mind, beyond all ethics? Unlike us who are caught between savoring power and wanting good, is that will all mastering? Or is it like Agamemnon caught in the coils of its own power? Born before all birth, is if there is a beginning at all, progenitor of death, which cannot be born, for death has no death, yet death is and will be as long as the conceiving mind and the suffering soul intertwine on this earth, exist in some living form or another, in the depths of all causality, the deep suspension upon which floats all being. Like flowers yield to bare branches, and that one branch feels springy sap course through it before the earth is clouded by migrating honeybees so febrile. The mind surges as passion inundates the senses, servile to seasons. Yet it reasons forth, like the deliberate finger of a musician, drawing and enslaving free notes from thin air upon thought drawn strings. The will though in perpetual dream, like an old man, leans on reason to steady its gait. In the stillness of heart is the role of the ocean, the terrible magma that can burn all things to cinder, can also lift up into the sky crystalline towers of rock and ice. When the mind and the will engage in a tectonic jostle, can the soul overreach? Is there a burnishing? Is there a liquefaction? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Ravi. Um, and I, I like the um, the references to um, things that are familiar to us here in this part of the world. You mentioned uh, sunbird, sunbirds with their feathers on fire, and joysticks uh, whose smoke can curl and, and um, fill the air. Um, and uh, there are also references to um, classical um, knit, um, like Agamemnon. So it, it, it follows um, what uh, Ian uh, wrote earlier about Troy. Um, so they're, they're related. Um, wait, so what is the inspiration for this again, uh, Ravi? Excuse me? Uh, what is the inspiration for your poem? Yeah, this is, uh, I think the poem kind of um, deals with a whole lot of uh, quibblings uh, on uh, the relationship between will, the mind and the soul, uh, from uh, before Plato down towards, uh, down to even uh, the Gregorian, uh, you know, ethics and lectures um, on the relationship between the will, the soul, faith and uh, the mind. It's about uh, freedom. It's about what freedom would really mean to oneself. Uh, th these are more questionings than real, really answers. Uh, I perhaps have not uh, really completed the poem yet. Uh, I may want later. I don't know. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's, um... It's a great start, though. It's, it's, is it going to be a, a cycle of poems on freedom and how people can get? No, it's when they get it's more freedom? it's more contemplative. Okay. Uh, it's more uh, going down uh, the dark stairs of one's heart, as Yeats might say. Uh, it's it's delving deep inside oneself. Uh, it's to find answers to one's centrality, uh, the, the individual will's centrality in an adumbrating universe. Okay. Is, is this going to be the start of a, of a book? I don't know yet. Right. Sounds like it's like an autobiographical um, meditation. Right? Could be. Starting Could be. Book. Okay. Yeah.
profound stuff. Clive, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, a bit different from me today. I mean, you all, all, all those who know me know me. I'm a bit of a lunatic, and um, but I'm going back to a poem I wrote to to fit the theme, really, to um, a poem I wrote about seven years ago. Um, uh, um, everybody who knows me knows that it's not an exaggeration to say spoken word. If it didn't save my life, it certainly rescued it. And this poem is about that. Um, and it's called Spoken Word. It's very original. It sounds absurd, but not long ago, spoken word was something I'd never really heard and thought of as an art form. Never knew there was a scene in which I could play a part. In my isolated heart, there was poetry, yes. I read it and I wrote it, but never really knew that much about it. I had my favourites whose work would strike a chord, but was easily bored by the stuff I didn't understand. No one grasps the highbrow if they've never learnt the basics, if peak learning years were wasted in an avalanche of illness and abuse. Social skills are poetry and any ploy can be employed to avoid an effort to fill a void when the pain of being different is an overriding shame. You name it, it came back to haunt me. It's a bit like being unemployed, that impenetrable barrier of needing experience to get a job and the job to get experience. Life was the job I didn't have. I didn't have the knowledge to grab the chances that were clouded in uncertainty and self-doubt. My mind numbed by addiction to prescription drugs. Opioids, barbiturates, antidepressants combined to control the physical pain, but tied creative thought in chains, imprisoned me in cells of sedation, clothed me in self-loathing. It's hard to remember how I escaped this, but I did somehow. Ideas learned to walk again and at the rising of the sun began to run. I discovered the art that saved me, the scene that gave me hope by accident. A string of coincidence led me to an open mic, a quivering wreck who rose from the deck to put a voice to words I'd never said. Step by step gaining in strength until I reached a point where it all made sense. People understood me. And gradually I learned I could be something more than I would be were it not for this discovery. Now, there are people who seem to like me, people I love dearly who make me happy when they're near me, filling the spaces once contaminated with self-hatred, beaten, bruised and naked. Those who understand, who care, have seen their share of troubles, but have talent oozing out of them with every word they share. This scene is my new drug. It drags you in, it hugs you, and will never let you go. Addiction brings the highs without the lows. And for the first time in my life, I'm certain that the drugs are working. Thank you. That's wonderful, um, Clive. So um, spoken word uh, can redeem people. Um, is this a personal experience, Clive? I'm sorry? Is that a personal experience, how spoken yes. words can... Yes, 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 very much so, yes. Um, um, I mean, yes. The, these days I'm more into comedy and comic spoken word <laughs> than serious, but I wouldn't have got there without the platform that I found. And yeah, it completely transformed my life, absolutely, 100%. And for how long have you been uh, doing spoken word poetry? Uh, since 2014, so nearly nine years now. Oh, that's great. It's, um, I discovered this all completely, but as I said in the poem, completely by coincidence, a friend of a friend of a friend who, so, who I didn't really know, who I only knew on Facebook, bumped into somebody who was at the Poetry Slam and mentioned me and uh, sort of we got to know each other and that, you know, that was that. Started going to open mics and um, it just got hooked. Okay. And, 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 and what was Clive before spoken word like? Uh, a wreck basically I, I, <laughs> um, yeah I've had a, a lot of um, illness throughout my life and uh, mm -hmm. I'm always always very shy and um, I had a very 
let's say difficult childhood um and i just had no self-confidence no self-belief and i didn't i did and i didn't want to mix with people i was very much a loner and um it was you know i just i was nothing really i went to work came home and and that was it it's a very inspiring story clive thank you clive thank you for your trust your courage transparency vulnerability it's humbling thank you avishi you're next So, um, hi everybody. So this is my first time here and I'm very excited and I'm also kind of nervous because everybody here is like so good at this and like it seems so intimidating to be here but I'm just going to go with this right now. So I'm 13. I'm Avishi Gurnani. I'm from Singapore. Like I was born in India but I'm in living in Singapore right now and a poem I'm about to read is titled Resurgence. So I didn't specifically write it according to the prompt. I had a poem before. I edited it and renamed it Resurgence. Recycling. So, um, Resurgence. The world was led astray. I hear the too bright light of the flickering street lamp. I see the wind whistling through the remaining trees. Water flows down my cheeks, salty. One day short of a conflicted existence, one day past a blessed one. The quiet is too loud, the storm seems too soft. Breaking the air before the shots are heard, I can feel the bullets swirling, whirling, dancing. I keep my eyes closed, evading the chilly air. Even the dark sky is no longer filled with stars. I sense the shadows still lurking, but they are farther away. The orange of dawn breaks across, filling the sky with a fiery hue. Light would come soon. Life had seen betray. The world down below was grey. Once a tiny sapling, and now sturdy and strong as the ground below. How old it was, nobody knew. And one way to find out was one nobody could endure. Home and family. My relief from the rain, my hope in the hurricane. The day came finally, and dark and stormy clouds poured. The home was gone. But beside the stump, a tiny sapling was ready to grow. Life had found a way. Um, Thank you. And I just realized I forgot to mention my inspiration. So this poem hey, is... Um, yeah, so Avishi is in a top school here in Singapore. And um, like she said, she's only 13, that's one three. Um, and um, she's also a published poet here, by the way. And, um, how many books have you published, Avishi? Oh, um, six so far. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm working on my mystery series right now. So hopefully that will come soon. Wonderful. Yes. So a, you're an inspiration for, for us all. Um, great. And um, um, maybe you can tell us something about your, your poem. Um, how did that come about? Uh, so I've recently realized that my poetry tends to be fixated a lot on what I read, what I write, um, as in like my own writing feeds into my own poetry. That sounds weird, but it means that something that I've written before will fuel my emotions and make me want to write about it more. So I started writing about war like a couple of months ago, like because I was 12 then, 11, if you count the Taliban Afghanistan thing. and. I didn't understand it then. like I didn't get what the whole fuss was about I was like I just want to watch like cartoons but then I realized that the stuff that I saw on tv was real it wasn't a movie it was actually happening to people around the world it was actually impacting people my age girls my age weren't able to go to school weren't able to study so 
then I started writing about war and then it became like an addiction kind of so it spurred me so this poem was half about war and half about resurgence so the first part is about um a scene because I have a person in Ukraine who I know very distantly and I think that his call to me one day was shocking and it was very emotional for me because just oh, seeing the, where, where does where does he live uh Avish, which part no, yeah he's like yeah, yeah. a distant relative's relative's friend okay. yes i'm gonna be honest i have no idea <laughs> i'm not equipped to handle the geography of ukraine yet but i think that seeing um the damage his house was seriously damaged he couldn't live in it anymore he had to travel to his aunt's house far away he traveled out of the country a few days later just realizing that this is impacting people who have basically they have done nothing to deserve this they have done nothing to deserve this invasion or anything that's related to it and they have not like I'm sure some of them have done some hideous crimes or something, but not all of them. Most of them are innocent and it's not fair. I'm here, I'm able to be here right now talking on Zoom, on technology, on an iPad. And people are out there suffering, dying. It's just like the full impact of life is not fair, like kind of hit me. So that's the inspiration. Yeah. Maybe that's uh, your role at the moment, uh, Avishi, at a more mature 13 compared yeah. to a year ago. Um, just to express like the, the fragility of your friends or your distant relatives' life and yeah. how somehow they find hope in, in their situation. Yeah, exactly. It's and also the people here um, don't know it, but uh, Avishi is also an artist. Um, do you happen to have your book there with the uh, with the uh, <laughs> with the paintings and the drawings? Maybe you can show it to us. Um, Unfortunately, okay, not. No, you don't have it with you. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, but maybe, um, maybe here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, um, but I really do love painting. I I would show it to you. Yeah. But I really do love painting. I think that it's um, understanding that there are different ways to express yourself and being able to be given a voice. Like the people in Ukraine right now, they are unable to have a voice for themselves. Oh. <laughs> it's one of yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, that's the book I wrote. Um, it's an anthology of my poems and my art. I wrote it when I was 10. Yeah, 10. Nine turning 10. So this is a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Right. Wonderful. Yeah, ma Thank maybe you. my students can learn from you. <laughs> yeah. Avishi, my, my takeaway from what you just shared is for anyone, it takes a tremendous amount of courage to face the ugly painful and you had the audacity to not just stare at it but to give it a platform of voice thank you so much that means a lot to me because i think that it's really understanding that we have been given this gift there are people out there who are unable to do this for themselves so being able to be given this gift is already something that's beyond words and being able to utilize that on a platform is just something that we have to do. We are obligated to do that as um, a member of society, as a member or citizen of the world who's able to really stand up for this. I mean, it's our responsibility. Well said. You spoke to my Thank heart. you very much for that reminder, Avishi. <laughs> <laughs> for all of us here. <laughs> all right. Jennifer, would you like to take the stage, please? Hi, thank you, Avishri. I just wanted to say that I'm so happy to hear somebody your age speaking this way. It really gives me a lot of hope. I'll try and share screen.
Um, sorry, my sharing screen successfully or I'm not? No. Not yet. Okay. I'm just so bad at this. Um, okay, I'll see how this goes. Okay, so this is called Where Are You? It's written to the prompt and it's written in the Dua Tres Pentas that form which originated in last year's Sing Raimo. I will read it right now and I'll read it one way and try and go another way reading it the second round. Phoenix, where are you? Happy to have found your place on the map of Arizona. Greek mythology linked you to the sun and Arabia. That was the story. Maybe you reside in many places as you arise from each heap of ashes. I don't want to nag, but why don't you spell Phoenix like Felix with this magic bag? Ah, you are a bird. Understandably, any link with cats should be avoided. Phoenix, could it be that you're following phonics and starting your name with P-H? Immortality is what you're about. Better than a cat. Nine lives and it's out. You change from ashes to amber embers, then turn green and off you go recycling. Phoenix, you can thrive in arid deserts from which sprigs may spring. So to streams of dreams, doble felicidad, dragon and phoenix, new life and weddings, longevity springs. Long Feng Tai siblings, not double trouble. Such fraternal twins are deemed auspicious. Phoenix, I'm thinking of resurrection this time of the year, when Easter draws near of the empty tomb, centuries ago of the Messiah, who still loves us so. I'm going to read backwards, stanza by stanza. Of the empty tomb centuries ago of the Messiah who still loves us so. Phoenix, I'm thinking of resurrection this time of the year when Easter draws near. Long Feng Tai siblings, not double trouble, such fraternal twins are deemed auspicious. Doble felicidad, dragon and phoenix, new life and weddings, longevity springs. Phoenix, you can thrive in arid deserts from which sprigs may spring, so too streams of dreams. You change from ashes to amber embers, then turn green and off you go, recycling. Immortality is what you are about, better than a cat, nine lives, and it's out. Phoenix, could it be that you're following phonics and starting your name with P, H? Are you a bird? Ah, you are a bird. Understandably, any link with cats should be avoided. I don't want to nag, but why don't you spell phoenix like Felix with his magic bag? Maybe you reside in many places as you arise from each heap of ashes. Greek mythology linked you to the sun and Arabia. That was the story. Phoenix, where are you? Happy to have found your place on the map of Arizona. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. It's, it's such a fun poem. Um, and it's also multicultural. Um, yeah, so uh, um, is this inspired by all your experiences? Um, yeah, you've got a, you got you have a Spanish um, alias, right? <laughs> on yes, on social media. Um, is, is that because of um, your personal history? Well, it started without. Um, it was just. It started as a name on Facebook when I wanted to start an account during the COVID times. Yeah, yeah. And in Spanish, it means I am an advocate. Um, so, and I would like to think of myself as an advocate for hope. And mm -hmm. yeah, so that's that's, that's what it good. was. And also it, it sounds like avocado and I think it's a nice fruit. And soybean as well, the soy part. It's a super fruit. Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, you're quite inventive. So you have you have your own poetic form. The Dua Tres Penta step form. 
Yeah, uh, how did this come about? Oh, well, this is interesting because mm. on 22nd, 422, 22422, um, last year, it was Simple Rhymo Month, and mm. the prompt was to, to write a poem on soil and also to try and create a new poetry form. Mm. So without knowing very much about poetry at all, I thought that I'll just put a lot of rules into the new form that I was going to create. And so then that's why the dual transplanter step form has got many, many requirements and prerequisites that we need to have. So the name dua means two in Malay. So it has to contain at least two languages. And then, um, yeah, there are a lot of, I mean, each number has got a separate meaning and prerequisite that we need to satisfy. Yeah. And the step. Um, and the step, the spiral. There's, yeah. there's a rhythm there. And uh, Ravi actually um, suggested the name for the stanzas because each step is actually a mini poem and each stanza, um, it, now it's called junctioning stanzas. So it's like a traffic junction. You don't have to go one direction. At a traffic junction, you can make a decision whether you're going to go right, left, or, you know, or east, west, north. I, I'm very bad at directions, so I can't even start to to tell you the directions that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that that um, are entailed. Yeah. It's I'm still to trying to master going in one direction. Then, <laughs> but, so <laughs> I'm completely. Oh, Amazed, you know, and, uh, kind of in awe of what um, of doing it two or three, four directions at once. Yep. So basically, in this form, you can read the stanzas in any order that you want. I just did that in reverse order, but you can actually skip and make them kind of like random. Or uh, just pick whatever stanzas you like. And the other thing is also I wanted to emphasize on the penta part of it, which is five. So every line has five lines. Uh, sorry, every line has five syllables unless that line is not totally in English. Yeah. So there it's are a lot of like, so it's like the, the multiverse in microcosm. <laughs> yes, I suppose you can call it that, yeah. Yeah, great. Can I just call it team? <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's a shorter name, yes. I think, yeah, it would do. Team for the rest of you means profoundly deep. Like it's form. actually very small poems that are just linked together. Yeah, just, you know, just. Yeah. All right. We're approaching the end of the show. Justin, do you have any interest in presenting something? Okay, um, I have something about the empty nest syndrome um, about Singapore HDBs. I'm um, sharing screen. I oh, can you see. Okay. Um, for those who don't live in Singapore, um, a HDB is a housing development block which like um, 80% of Singaporeans live in. I am a housing development flat being given up for resale. Nearly half my life, my family has lived with me and I will. From the savvy teenagers forever checking email to adults already endless parcels via Amazon mail. Busy ever growing old. Now it's time to let them go. This HB unit will miss them sorely, that's for sure. I already feel empty during family vacations to Kuala Lumpur. Hearing them decide, discuss excitedly about moving plans breaks my heart. Am I fated to live on hollow? Forced for my flat dwellers apart. The boisterous boys and gregarious girls grow from asking adults for help with shoelaces to eagerly pestering parents first thing morning to bring them places. Go cycling or swimming, but you promised was the wine. The great outdoors hold such a lure that kids would pine. The little gestures that mean so much, I'll do the dishes we eat while we like for lunch. <clears throat> then I vomit out my insights. Men in work boots, stamping and rip and tear, carry out renovation, moving furniture out in pra practical practice pairs, reduce to white walls and strip of bare necessities, starts me pondering the complexities of HDB and A week or so, 
My breath held and my fingers crossed I prayed. With my gutter inlets, haphazardly split outside this array. Where I get a transplant of people, my heart, a fresh coat of paint, I felt nauseous, even with nothing inside me, feeling lightheaded and faint. There's this, there's perplexing drilling going on, and the walls are being torn down. I have a headache, not surprising the drilling, I frown. Will they ever stop? Surely there must be some law about noise pollution. I darkly contemplate a sudden surge causing electrocution. Oh, oh yay, today's the day. The new family is moving in, hooray. I get out my courage and I'm reborn from ashen despair of yesterday. How at the boy and girl who down in the heaviest flat who donned Hogwarts robe and a sorting hat? From which they attempt to pull forth the start of Godric Gryffindor. Look for sign of forthcoming, driven by extraordinary loyalty to the fall. Unbeknownst to them, they are the spell components of said Phoenix, as their grandparents sit watching a sappy show, Share Phoenix. And yeah. I give thanks for the, my humans who my existence illumes immovable object no longer dreary with mobile shrieking kids so cheery. Thank you. An epic poem about the heartland of Singapore, Justin. Thank you, Mr. For, for the promise of yours. <laughs> and I, I like the, de the details. So you, you managed to weave in Kuala Lumpur there and Kleenex. <laughs> Okay. Um, and uh, are, are you writing about family experiences, Justin? Um, I actually lived like um, in the River Valley area last time. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, yeah, so, so I, I only recently like moved back to HDB living. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, it's and kind of personal experience. And how has that experience been uh, living in the... HDB Heartland. Oh, which uh, which district do you live in now? Um, I, I live in uh, Marine Parade. Marine Parade, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, how is it different now from living in River uh, Valley? It's much more convenient. We don't have to like take a bus to like a shopping center or what. Like everything is located in town. Yeah. yeah and for those who are not in Singapore, um, the HD. Uh, HDB stands for the Housing Development Board. Um, these are um, public housing estates, yes. and um, about eighty percent of Singaporeans oh, live in them. Yeah. And um, many uh, Singaporean poets draw a lot of inspiration from um, living in these housing estates, and uh, mm -hmm. Justin is one of them. Thank you, Mr. Bills. Thanks to Justin. Very well. So we are approaching the end of our show. And there's one more who hasn't gone. Um, he was supposed to go after Jennifer, I think. Ooh. He had messaged. Yeah, but I don't and think he got no, a chance. It's, it's Weezer. Neil, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I, I actually <laughs> directly messaged you um I think twice, but it's I fine. I apologize. It's fine. I didn't catch that. It's fine. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, do I put on? Let me try sharing the screen. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is my poem. It, oh God, why is it blocking the way? It, it's called um plant a tree program. Um, wait, do I explain my inspiration now, or do I just read the poem? Uh, you can make it a little bigger. Oh yeah. All right. Um. Anyways. Uh. Hi, my name is Neil Wies, and I'm a student in in US. High school. I'm a student in Singapore, basically. I'm 16 this year, which is sad. Uh, yeah, anyways, here's my poem. We were all born with a silver chunk hole in our mouths, all lowered into a haphazardly dark hole, some raised to compete for rooting space, some raised to die because the adults forgot to not cover our root collar, Despite explicit warnings in the instructions, I've heard the adults put shovels of compost at our feet, degrading us to nurture us. Then again, I've been deprived of emotion for so long. A rot has taken root in my limbic system. Inflammation is still growth to the powers that be. And if you make it part of the synthetic greenery, which didn't die to the adults' brown thumbs, Rows and rows of trees of uniform height planted everywhere the eye can see. 
beside the road in the small island in the middle of the road, in the middle of a park in an Ulu neighborhood. If you decide this walled garden city is an affront to nature, try as you might, the trees can't uproot themselves. If you burn out in your funeral pyre, they'll place you half you know, they'll place your half-combusted ashes back into the soil and remake your resurrection again and again. Don't worry if you return diminished, as starting anew starts to get old. We, when we get tired of you getting tired of forever, we'll use your ashes as fertilizer, productivity with sustainability. So um, this poem was actually um, written not for this at first. At Dr. Vallis's behest, I um I tried linking this poem to the theme of Phoenix starting over. Um, it felt a little shoehorned in. I might try to integrate it more deeply next time when I saw. Yeah, next time. But um, also this poem is one page long because I'm submitting this to a competition and that competition says that I need to make the poem one page long. So yeah. Also, yeah, I this was actually um, inspired by an event where basically my family and I, my mother, my sister and I, my father wasn't there on that day. Um, yeah, we went to a street in our neighborhood and then we started planting trees. No, the entire neighbor, a bunch of neighbors planted trees. And yeah, a lot of them died. A lot of the trees, right? <laughs> trees. Yeah, a, a lot of the trees died, which <laughs> is a pity. And that kind of inspired me to write that poem because it's kind of a waste. And also, um, I, and how, does this, how does this reflect the the experience of sixteen year olds in Singapore? Yeah, it it reflects my my angst towards the education system, um, and basically the adult oriented nature of society in general. Like, I felt really, really um, how do I say this? Frustrated when I was writing this poem, okay. which was why I wrote it in the first place, because I needed somewhere to vent my frustration. Um, and yeah, this poem was the result of that. Um, yeah. OK. Yeah, I, I liked how you sustained the, the analogy. OK. The All right. Um, thanks. Thank you, Mizen. That was so cool. I'm telling you, I so agree with the analogy as someone else in the education system. I think that um, I'm very happy that I'm in Raffles College because they give you a lot of freedom there. Um, they treat you well, but still, um, not enough freedom. I know. Also, who are you from? Sorry, going a bit off topic here. Uh, Penis High School of Math and Science. That's cool. Yeah, it is sometimes. I, I'm, an, I'm an examiner or an assistant examiner for Cambridge International, and I mark a lot of um, English um, papers there. And <laughs> <laughs> not, not that I would know if it was you, uh, we Zen, you know, we, we don't get given the names, we just get a number. <laughs> there, so you, your identity is safe. Uh, and um, but it's interesting because you know I I marked I marked the the writing paper and there's two sections. One is the directed piece of writing, and one you get a choice of four or five topics, not discursive or narrative. But it's it's interesting. You get some very, very telling insights because when kids. 15, 16 are writing, particularly in exam conditions, they're very candid and frank. No, they don't sort of, uh, you know, they, they haven't developed that sort of um, sophistication or way of kind of covering up 
that you do as adults, you know, like talking in double speak, whatever. So you you get a very interesting insight. So it's yeah, I, I I'm kind of I've always interested, particularly you know, like with what what goes on in Singapore and how uh, sixteen year olds are negotiating their way through the system. So no, anyway, good luck if you haven't done your exam yet. Don't worry, I. <laughs> But good luck anyway with uh, with all of your uh, future um, your future endeavours. No, cheers. Yeah, thank you very much, Ian. I'm a big fan of any punch that sneaks by censorship. So well done, Neil. Neil. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Lucian, and apologies once again. This has become making a bit of a habit of this. Uh, it's just that I have this conflicting meeting, but pleased to be here. And Eric, uh, to your theme of uh, Phoenix, I'm gonna do a little cheat. Uh, I'm gonna repeat or read uh, read out a poem that you've certainly heard uh, at the last PFS when all of us, pretty much most of us, were uh, together. Um, I can't even remember when it was, but uh, Phoenix. It's the same poem. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, I self-immolate and then combust. I turn my energies to my entropy, disintegrate subatoms and debris. I stand in smoldering smithereens of what once was and may have been, choosing to quit when I was ahead. Worry not, grieve not, I am not dead. Merely a pause as I begin to recreate, blowing on dying embers in the grate, stoking the fires that have slowly died, bellows that had given up and sighed. Flames of yellow, gold, and purple flow as I seek to restore my former self and glow. I heal myself and then slowly reassemble what I did once so deliberately disassemble. I know you stretched out then to lend me your hand. In your ready palm, I reignited and burnt my brand, rekindled all my fire, turned on this flaming light, flying high up in the sky, comet burning bright. Thank you. Great, Neil. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, um, And it's also... Uh... Uh, there, there is a scientific element to it that I'm, I'm sure Wiesen could appreciate, since he's a he's a science student. <laughs> All right, um, and uh, yeah, Neil, um, yeah, what's the inspiration for that work? Maybe you can tell us a little bit. Oh, oh well, I mean, uh, you mentioned science uh, back in my. Uh, sort of misspent youth, uh, I too was a science student, and it tends to creep in a lot, uh, whether it's physics or mathematics. So a lot of that was sort of enshrined in uh, high school work, I think. And, um, you know, that's the scientific side, but I, I've read a lot on the Phoenix, and we just don't have enough time today. But I mean, it's just so interesting that the Phoenix obviously occurs very strongly in the Oriental culture right across Asia, but equally, uh, we all know about, uh, or are more familiar perhaps with uh, the Greek mythology, but there's a lot of it within um, the Old Testament, and not everyone's necessarily familiar with that version where the phoenix in the Garden of Eden was the only bird, animal, beast amongst everyone in the Garden of Eden who uh, actually did not partake of the forbidden fruit, every other animal after Adam had tasted it, part of the forbidden fruit. And perhaps uh, the background to that is uh, the long, the boon of long life that the phoenix was then granted. So I've always been obsessed with the the phoenix right across. And of course, in uh, Egyptian culture, it's really deeply embedded. And I've read a lot about uh, Egypt. I spent a, like a decade in the Middle East. So. There's that. It's, um, sorry, quite strong in the, it's quite strong in Chinese culture. Yeah. Like it's a motif in um, Peranakan embroidery. Yeah. Right? And yes. Thanks. Thanks for that. Cheers. 
Eric, it's lovely you mentioned that because Kim Lin was very proud to have picked her Pranakan Batik Phoenix to put on your poster. Yeah. Neil, thank you. Thank so you. I'm going to share my piece and Eric's going to close us out. <clears throat> um, last week, Eric, you read a piece uh, that foreshadowed this week's theme. Mm. And I said of it, it was sacramental and I will not look at chicken triani the same way. And this is my direct response to it. Ascending the Phoenix, a twin cinema by Lucian Tan. See the Phoenix, yes, yes, I am that cool. See the Phoenix snatched by its head. What the fuck? Whipped overhead like a bloody piñata. I'm not ready yet. Iridescent green and orange feathers stripped. Hey, those were expensive. Exposing scrawny body. <clears throat> Yikes. Feeling insecure. Guts ripped out. Nobody should have to see that. Body dismembered with whacks of a clean. Feeling V I O L A T E D. Dustings of garam masala, turmeric, and chili. Ooh, aromatics. I smell good. So good. So fine. Da, 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 da. Cardamom, clove, cinnamon, star anise. Yes, yes, yes. Caraway mace, feeling regal, sauteed onion, rice, so comfy, like a warm blanket, steamed under pressure, pressure, pushing down on me, pressing down on you, no man asked for, mouth watering scent wafting across Gimo, why am I here? Treatment complete, saffron oil drizzled onto rice. I am a feast. Cauldron of chicken biryani sent to honor, Ibrahim ascended. See the phoenix, see the phoenix snatched by his head, whipped overhead like a bloody piñata. Iridescent green and orange feathers stripped, exposing scrawny body. Guts ripped out, body dismembered with whacks of a cleaver. Dustings of gavram, masala, turmeric and chili, cardamom, clove, cinnamon, star anise, caraway, mace, sauteed onion, rice, steamed under pressure. Mouth watering scent wafting across gimo. Treatment complete, saffron oil drizzled onto rice, Cauldron of chicken biryani sent to honor. Yes, yes, I am that cool. What the fuck? I'm not ready yet. Hey, those were expensive. Yikes. Feeling insecure. Nobody should have to see that. Feeling V I O L A T E D. Ooh, aromatics. I smell good. So good, so fine. Yes, 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 yes. Feeling regal, so comfy like a warm blanket. Pressure, pushing down on me, pressing down on you, no man ask for. Why am I here? I am a feast. Ibrahim ascended. And Mate, it's, uh, uh, that's a word feast. Uh, it's a final poem, for sure. Um, 
Lucian, um, and um, it reminds me of uh, music for a sushi restaurant. The music video. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. And um, yeah, Kevin is not here yet. Um, so uh, should I just read this? Um, yes. I have one more poem. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is from the Poetry Global Network anthology entitled Kaleidoscope Poetry. Uh, it's available on Amazon, right? Um, and um, this um, last poem is a persona poem uh, from a cycle of uh, poetry that I'm working on about um, intergenerational trauma. Uh, so the, um, the persona in this poem is a daughter uh, who was born out of wedlock um, and um, her estrangement from her father has also caused her distance from her um, from her husband and the family right? and um, she's trying to recall trying to put together uh, pieces of her life in this um, in this poem it's entitled ghost um, christine's epilogue sifting through poems Journals, stories about the Bahau quilt against the late afternoon sun, one August after Papa's death. I know I can't restitch, applicate patches, as I can't change how I came to be. Mama, whom I want to remember, Lieutenant Lee, whom I glimpse in the mirror, my family, Papa, are all gone. My fingers shiver as I embroider their figures in a simple style with a blanket stitch as the room turns black. I, uh, I have to do the quilt right. Make sure the fabric patches are in straight rows. Sewing them together prevents a mini breakdown. I catch a whiff of brandy and embassy filters, but without Papa in the room, without Papa in the room. He told us, he took his last breath without me. Papa used to scoop me in his arms and made me sing a sad song. Ancient quilt makers need to leave a space or so the mistake to show only God's perfect. Mama wrapped me in a quilt she had meant to give away. That's lost. Here I make another. And so that references um, that the poem is in place of this long lost quilt, um, which was wrapped around her when she was an infant. That's it. Thank you very much. You've been a lovely audience. And thanks for all the great poems that we've heard tonight uh, from all ages, right? And uh, uh, people from all sorts of um, life conditions. Um, and all of us have found uh, redemption through different kinds of poetry, right? Um, different forms, um, whether it's spoken or, or published, right? And um, uh, it's a pity that Kemlin is not here <laughs> to give her benediction, but I suppose Lucian uh, is going to fill in for that. <laughs> so with that, Thank you once again, Eric, for a marvelous prompt to write to. Thank you very much, Lucian and all. Um, Kemlin was going to re read that twin cinema with me, but uh, she had to board the flight. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think my takeaway here is Kemlin and I worked really hard to, to shape between the lines to be a platform for the marginalized, to give a voice to those who do not. And we certainly heard very strong representations tonight. So thank you one and all. Be well, watch for the video on Club Mermaid. In the meanwhile, be blessed. Bye for now. Yeah, thank you very much, Lucian and all. See you.